All right, we'll get started here this morning. As you find your seat, we are going to be taking a, an excursion across the river to the biblical tabernacle experience. So if you are interested, um, Bob has a sign-up sheet. I want to say thank you to him for putting this together. It's going to be on March the 26th, okay? And uh, do we have a time that says, please arrive by 945 to ensure we can get into the 10 a.m. showing, okay? And that is arrive there at 945 okay so if you would like to go to this it's a a Mennonite group has put together a a um, a tabernacle of what it would have what it would have looked like okay and it kind of allows you to go inside and kind of see what the tabernacle was and we're kind of in the middle of that series um, and so on March the 26th, if you could be there at 945, he's got the address right here and, um, and whatnot. So if you could sign up for this, we'll pass this around. And there's obviously a decent amount of people not here today. So we'll have to kind of float this around over the next couple of days. And uh, that would be something fun to do as a church, kind of go over there, tour the tabernacle. Uh, adults ages 17 and up, it's $10 a person. For children 6 through 16, it's $7 a person. And all kids five and under are free. Okay, so that is the biblical tabernacle experience over there in Lancaster. We will be taking the Lord's Supper at the conclusion of the message here. And um, so if you have your Bibles, open them up to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew 26. For the most part, I have a simple message because the narrative is a lot of scripture. Um, but I feel like sometimes we can stray far enough away from the crucifixion account that we truly forget or we gloss over the agony that our Lord went through when he was on the cross. And... Uh, I think that it's appropriate to stop when we get to the Lord's Supper and review all that Christ did uh, while suffering for us. And I have a small uh, presentation on the computer screen that I'll use if I can. I'm going to set it up here. There we go. Okay, hopefully that works. If it doesn't work, I'll manually click it through. Um, but the Lord's Supper... Why do, we, why do we take the Lord's Supper? Obviously, the Catholic Church is known for its Mass, its, its Eucharist, the, the bread and the cup. Um, what, what is it modeled after? Well, in, in short, it's modeled after the, um, it's modeled after the Lord's, the, the Passover dinner that he had just before he went to the cross. It was in the middle of Passover season, and I think I messed up my presentation here. So give me one second and try to fix this. So we'll I give up. Oh, it happens. Okay. Just when I gave up. It Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, it's modeled after the Passover dinner that Christ would have had with his disciples on the eve prior to his crucifixion. And so it, the story kind of picks up in Matthew chapter number 26, right where we're going to be reading through from here to the end of Matthew chapter 27. Um, and this is why we take the Lord's Supper. So Jesus is there in the room, and um, he has just got 
finished talking to his disciples, praying for his disciples, and singing a, uh, or, or not singing a song, he'll sing a song here sh soon, but in verse 26, the Bible says this, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, the Catholics have misconstrued this into what they call now transubstantiation, where they actually actually believe that the minute that that bread touches your tongue, it literally becomes the Lord's flesh and body. But that's not what the purpose of what Jesus was saying here. What Jesus was saying was he was giving them a metaphorical piece of bread, a literal piece of bread with a metaphorical meaning. He was saying, hey, take, eat, eat this bread, and it will remind you of my body. Why was it important that we're, remind, that we're reminded of his body, the death that Christ would suffer? Well, think about what bread does. Number one, bread is good. Number two, in order for bread to give you life, what has to happen? Bread has to be crushed and swallowed. The bread has to be eaten. The bread has to be chewed. The bread has to be consumed in order for you to receive the nutrients of that bread. And th that is what Jesus was, was, was ultimately trying to get across. He was trying to say, look, my body is going to be consumed. My body, my flesh is going to be bruised. It is going to be chewed. It is going to be broken in order for you to have life. Verse 27 says, He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So he's going on to say that the that the bread represents his, his body being broken and the, the cup represents the blood that he was going to shed. It was a very symbolic thing that Jesus was doing. And he was saying, when you take the Lord's Supper, you are remembering the death, the brokenness of his body, and the blood that was shed for your sins. That is what you are doing when you take the Lord's Supper. Okay? And so now I want us to, to pick up from the story here, and I want to read about the, the body and the, the blood of Jesus Christ. See what he went through. See the agony that he did. But in particular, as I mentioned earlier, I really want you to focus on man's actions and God's actions because they're vastly different in this entire narrative. So if you will, please begin reading in verse number 33. The Bible says, um, so verse 30, it says this, When they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So I took a picture when I went to Israel here on the screen. I am standing at the Mount of Olives, okay? And uh, the Mount of Olives was just over the, the valley there, and that's the view of Jerusalem that you would have on the Mount of Olives. You're overlooking the entire city there, and of course the Garden of Gethsemane, as we're going to get to in just a little bit, is actually on the Mount of Olives. So Jesus was in the upper room. He takes the Lord's Supper, he institutes the Lord's Supper there in that room by giving them the bread and giving them the cup. And then they sing a hymn. And when they sing a hymn, the Bible says in verse 31, he says, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. So he's saying to his disciples, all of you are going to be offended because of me tonight. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Well, Peter is given a prophecy. He's saying, or excuse me, Jesus is given a prophecy. He's saying, all of you are going to betray me because it's written that if you smite the, the, the shepherd, the sheep will, will scatter and it'll be tonight that that happens. But he gives a prophecy, but he says, I'm going to rise again, essentially is what he's saying here. Okay. And in verse 33, Peter answered, and I like Peter. He says unto him, though all men shall be offended because of the Yet will I never be offended. Now, 
I like the boldness here of Peter, but essentially he says, Jesus, you're wrong. That's essentially what Peter is saying. He's saying, no, 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 no. I'll never offend you. Now, Peter is pretty confident in himself. Peter is saying, I will defy the scriptures. I am different than everybody else. That's what Peter was saying. And uh, Jesus looks at him and in verse 34 says, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, not just once or twice, but thrice. You're tonight, and you're going to do so before that cock crows in the morning. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So Peter got them all ready and challenged. Man, Peter, was he stood up. He was like, not me, Lord. And then eventually he had all the disciples saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to die with you. So they understood Jesus' claim that he would die. And that's why Peter was saying here, if we have to die with you, we'll die. And all the other disciples chime in, and you've got now Jesus Christ stating truth, and these other, at this point, now 11 disciples, because Judas had already left. And so these 11 disciples are standing there with Christ, and they're all denying what the Lord just said would happen. Verse number 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now, we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there is Holly at uh, one of the olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm glad she's not out here. I might be killed, okay? But uh, that is the Garden of Gethsemane. When you go to Israel, or when we, when we go to Israel, if we're able to go to Israel, we'll get to go to this garden. And uh, to this day, it's still there on the hillside of the Mount of Olives, overlooking the, the city of Jerusalem. And uh, here, are, here are, whoops, there is a picture of an olive tree. Um, and uh, the olive trees, when, when they just kind of, Willie probably could tell you more and more about these, right? But, but from my understanding, olive trees will, will plant trees right, right underneath its roots. And the, and, the, and the idea is this is a very old olive tree because of how big it is. The way that it grows is very interesting. Um, it doesn't mean that this tree would have been around during the life of Christ, but it, it was around for a long, 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 long time. Okay, you can see this here. And this is still in the Garden of Gethsemane. So keep in mind, this is picture taken during the day, but we now have come to the evening. So the, the dinner is now over. The day is far spent. Jesus has left his disciples a promise that they're going to deny him. They all deny that promise. Jesus says, no, the prophecies in the scriptures. And he takes them to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, sit ye here while I go pray yonder. Okay, now here... The Bible says in verse number 37, He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So ultimately, three disciples end up in the Garden of Gethsemane this night with Christ. The other eight disciples must have been on the Mount of Olives somewhere else. But Jesus took three here to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. Now, there are a few times in life where we hit rock bottom, and we pour out our soul to people. But on occasion, that happens. And when we do, it is... It is an extremely important time in our life. And if there's ever a time where you begin to pour out your soul to somebody and they are not responsive to you, 
or they're staring at you like you're some crazy person or you, or that they, they don't understand or they try they try talking to you and teaching you or pointing you and or chiding you or this clam up and you begin to say why did he even pour out my soul to you in the first place so jesus begins here to tell them something he says my soul he is pouring out his soul to his disciples here he's saying to them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, and here's one of the beautiful things about the scriptures that you get insight into the actual prayer of Christ. What did he say while in the garden of Gethsemane? Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What is he referring to, this cup? To the same cup he was referring to when? The Passover dinner. And what did the cup represent? His blood. And he was saying, let this pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. What a prayer. Christ was saying, I don't want to die but I'll die if that's your will. Let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We already saw man's broken promises. I'll never abandon you. I'll never deny you. I'll die for you. Man has all the broken promises in the world. They may be good intentions. You might sit there and say, boy, I'm never going to do wrong <laughs> in the rest of my life. I'll never do that again. I'll never. And we, we use these bold statements so often, but man's words are filled and filled and filled with broken promises. Uh, how many of you have ever said, I've heard that before? Why, what are we saying? We're saying that we're used to broken promises. And now here we're seeing Christ's agony in prayer. That's what we're seeing. And then we see man's lack of concern. In verse number 40, it says, And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Could you imagine Christ saying, I'm sorrowful to the point of death. Watch with me. And an hour later, he comes back to these three innermost uh, circles of his disciples, and they're sleeping. While Christ is in agony, praying that he does not have to face the crucifixion, but if he does have to face it, he'll do it. And he comes back, he finds them asleep. Man's lack of concern. Verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What a true statement Jesus makes to these disciples. He, 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 he chides them, but in his, in his chiding, he, he, he points out a point. He says, man's spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I'll tell you, church, we have got to be careful. We've got to watch and pray, otherwise you'll enter into temptation. Because the idea here is that you don't want to do wrong, but if you're not careful, as Jim was talking about from Titus, if you're not careful, if you're not diligent, if you don't have a, a tuned-in channel to the Lord, you will fall asleep. You will not do what you want to do. For Christ, it takes a concerted effort to be in in the will of of the Father. Verse number forty two says he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, "Oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, Thy will be done." And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Nothing's too, too much 
different than church. <laughs> How many of you ever fallen asleep in church before? <laughs> Mike, put your hand down. Okay. <laughs> and the eyes are. How many of you ever tried to stay awake before when you're trying to watch a movie or something? You're trying to stay awake. Hey, yeah. Okay. Uh, your eyes are heavy. And the second time Jesus comes back, he rebukes them the first time, and he comes back the second time, and they're sleeping again. Shows you man's lack of concern. In verse number 43, and he came in, uh, in verse number uh, 44, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now. And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. That's really one of the most powerful statements in the scriptures as Jesus comes back to his three most beloved disciples and he finds them asleep the third time. And he says, Sleep on now. I picture often in there, well, you know, you, sometimes it's, it's, I think movies are the, probably the easiest way for, for us to understand that where you watch a movie and by the end of the movie, some of your kids have fallen asleep. They're not in their, they're not in their beds, right? And so what do you do as a parent? You, you, you pick them up. Sleep on now. You tuck them into their bed. You close them up for the night. And in many ways, you're saying, sleep on now. Sleep on now. I feel like the Lord here is saying to us, sleep on now. Take your rest. You have no clue what I'm going through. This is not your battle. It's my battle. This is no longer your concern. It's my concern. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And isn't that a true statement? You think about that for one moment. He let us sleep while he stayed awake in the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet on the cross, he went to sleep while we stayed awake as he died in our place on the cross. This is the... the contrasting of Christ to sinners. The, the times where it was hard to, to stay awake, he stayed awake. And the times where it was hard to not stay awake, he fell asleep for us. The Bible says here in verse 47, While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold them fast, fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So you have man's broken promises, man's lack of concern, and now you've got man's betrayal. Here, and Judas, one of the twelve, comes up to Jesus and says, Hail, Master. And how does Jesus respond? Friend. Friend, wherefore art thou come? And Judas kisses him. And the Bible says that when they, when they saw who they, that whom Jesus... Judas kissed, they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand. Now, who is this referring to? We know this from other gospel accounts. This is Peter. Now, Peter, a few seconds ago, was doing what? Sleeping on the ground three times. And now, Peter is with Jesus. Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. <laughs> Peter is just the one of a kind. From the beginning of the story, Peter was saying, I'll never, I'll die with you. 
And then the next second, he's sleeping. Three times, and Jesus is saying, my soul sorrowful to even death. Jesus wakes him up. Peter, come on, it's time for me to get betrayed. Peter wakes up, sees what's happening, sees the betrayal. They get him Jesus. Peter takes out the sword, comes over, chops off the ear. The extreme. The man, man places revenge on his own failures. You ever done that before? You ever done wrong? And then try to make up for your wrong by doing something right and, and, and do it right so good that you want to pretend like the wrong never happened? We all do this. We all overreact. We all take the swords out in life and try to cut off the, the ears of of people. We all try to go out and, 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 and try to do something to make us feel better. When in all reality, it was Christ who responds to Peter. And he says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number, in verse number um, 52, says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? And he rebukes Peter. There is an ear on the floor. We know this from other gospel accounts. Jesus takes the ear and puts it back onto Malchus's head. A miracle takes place. Jesus picks up the ear and repairs it. And then he turns to Peter and he says, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Don't you think that I can call down 12 legions of angels? He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called 12,000. He could have called all the angels of the world to come down to earth to destroy the world and to set him free. He didn't need Peter. He could have done it himself. The Bible says in a different account that when all the men came and approached Jesus in a different gospel account, that when they went to take hands on him, that they fell down before him. And then they had to get back up and bound him. Jesus was saying a very true statement. He says, but if I did that, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Jesus was living a life by the scriptures in the will of the Father. And here these disciples, Peter, are sleeping, overpromising, overreacting. And the Bible says this in verse 55. He says, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitude. So he turns and he looks at all the people there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas included. He says, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hands on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Jesus looks at all of them. He says, you don't need to do this. I sat there in the temple and taught openly for three and a half years, and you never did this. But this is happening right now because the scriptures are going to be fulfilled. And what does Peter do? He puts his sword back in, right? He's listening to Jesus speak, and in verse 56 it says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. <laughs> Peter says, I'll never deny you. I mean, good out the list, right? Next thing you know, he's sleeping. Next thing you know, he's cutting off the ear. Next thing you know, he's getting the ear replaced, and he's getting rebuked. Next thing you know, he's running in for his life. Oh! down the Mount of Olives, over into Jerusalem. Peter and all the disciples forsaking Christ. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Okay, so here you have uh, Caiaphas's, Caiaphas's house, just a little artist rendering of the, of the trial that was to take place. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest. He was the Jewish high priest. This was all illegal, by the way, what was happening, even according to Jewish law. And I didn't want to get into this in a long, in a long trail here, but everything they did was in a trial. Vinny? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. All of this was, a, all of this was in a, uh, a false trial. 
So they rush him off to the high priest house. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priest. Annas was the, was the father-in-law to Caiaphas. And he truly was the man that had power. Caiaphas was the, was the high priest. He was the one who, who actually held the title, but Annas, the father-in-law, held the power. So they're in Caiaphas's house, which had just been built. Huge mansion. Herod the Great had did this to make his kingdom to be even bigger. And uh, they, drug, they dragged Jesus in, and they, the Bible says where the high priests were, uh, the high priests were the scribes and the elders were assembled in verse number 58. Now keep in mind, it's extremely late at night. In fact, it was so late at night that the disciples were, couldn't stay awake. They were sleeping and sleeping, and it seems as though each interlude was about an hour long. So you're probably into the dead of night here, probably 11 o'clock at night our time or so, 12 o'clock our time, okay? And for the, in that culture, they didn't have the electricity like we have today, and so in other words, they didn't stay up as long as they, as they stay up today. So you're talking, this was in the dead of night here. And the high priests and the scribes and the elders were all assembled. This was all a planned thing. They were waiting there, waiting there, waiting there, waiting there. While the disciples were asleep, Satan's forces were awake. And isn't that not a true statement? While Christians sleep, who's awake? Satan is. And he's trying to cause all kinds of havoc in this world. And you get down in verse number 58, says, But Peter followed him afar off. So Peter scampered, but he didn't scamper too far. And he's following the, the multitudes and Christ into, uh, the Bible says, afar off, unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So Peter somehow, someway gets inside the palace. And he's sitting there and he wants to know the end of the story. He wants to see what's going to happen to Jesus. Verse number 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. But found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? It's kind of humorous to me to see how man's accusations flop and flop and flop and flop against God. He's, and they're, they're looking for these false witnesses. The Bible says that many came and spoke, but none of them held any kind of, any kind of uh, jurisdiction, so to speak. And so finally they find two false witnesses. They come up and these two false witnesses actually say a truth. I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Jesus did say that, but he wasn't referring to the temple. He wasn't talking about some tearing down of some building. He was referring to the temple of his own body. He was saying, you can tear this temple down and I'm going to raise it from the dead in three days, which is exactly what they're doing right now. They're going to tear down Jesus and he's going to build it up in three days. And the high priest arose and says, answer us down nothing? I don't need to answer nothing. I already spoke that. It's true. Verse 63 says, but Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. Now, who was the living God? Jesus was the living God. As he stands there and the high priest is looking at Jesus saying, I adjure thee by the living God, as though he himself was the Lord of God. That thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, thou hast said, in other words, you said it. You said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Make no doubt about it, he was claiming deity there by going to the book of Daniel and saying, you will see me as the Son of Man coming again in all of his glory. So not only have you said, I am the Son of God, but I am the Son of God that will live forevermore, no matter what you do to me. It was a very dramatic prophecy. Then the high priest, understanding that dramatic prophecy, rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of 
death. Now, there's a problem here. What time of day are we? Night. Extremely late at night. The Jews did not have power to put somebody to death. They had power to do everything else, but they could not put somebody to death. So they had to get him in front of a Roman. They had to get him in front of a Roman court because the, Rome, the Romans had the power of death. And so while they wait for the dawn to appear, when the Roman courts would actually open, what do they do? In verse number 67, then did they spit in his face. Now, sometimes you ought to pause and just read what they did to Christ. One of these days, it would be interesting to see if we could find a volunteer who would even take one aspect of Christ's punishment. And we speak of the crucifixion often, but if I were to say, Jim, would you mind coming up here and I want to demonstrate what spitting in the face feels like? I don't even know if I could find a volunteer to do that aspect of it because of how, of how humiliating and disgusting that is. And this was just the beginning. It says, they spit in his face and buffeted him. The word buffeted means to hit with the fist, to punch. So they spit in his face and they began to punch him. And you're talking, he's bound. He, he's tied. He has no defense. And they are punching him and spitting him in his face. Hard to imagine what Jesus Christ is beginning to absorb. And then it says in verse 67, and, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. That's a slap. So you had some who spit. You had some who punched. And you have some who slap. All while Jesus is bound. Because he claimed to be the Messiah. The son of man who would come in all glory. And as they hit him and spit him, spit at him, verse 68, it says, They said, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he that smote thee? What's my name? There's a throng of people here. Crowds of people. The elders, the scribes, the, the chief priests. And they're saying, Psh, ha, what's my name? Tell me my name, thou Christ. Tell us. Who's the one who psh, spit at you? Tell us. In verse 69, it leaves the scene there. So that's going on inside the house of, Pau of, of, of uh, Caiaphas. But what's going on in the courtyard? It says, now Peter sat without in the palace. And a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I know what you're talking about. There comes a little girl. There's Peter sitting out there, and she's saying, I know you've been with Jesus. Now, that should have been a compliment. <laughs> Peter's like, I don't know what you're talking about. What is that? Denial. It's denial. And it goes on, verse 71. And when he was gone out into the porch, so Peter got uncomfortable. Peter got up, and he goes out to the porch. He moved location. Another maid, another little girl, saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I know not the man. Bring a Bible out here. I know not the man. And Peter, Peter not just, didn't just deny him, but he's denying him with an oath, under oath, that he knew not Jesus. This was the same man, for, for just brief reminding's sake, this was the same man who said, Though all offend thee, I will not offend thee. This is the same man who said, If I have to die with you, I'll die with you. This is the same man who took out a sword and cut off the ear of the disciple. Now here's two little girls and he's fainting in front of them. 
And he's saying, I don't know this man. I know not this man. And in verse number, verse number 73, it says, And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Everything about Peter identified him with Jesus Christ. That was, that was the blessing. That was, that, that, all, that, that is a compliment to a Christian. But when people can realize that you're a Christian, they're going to hate you. And they're going to put you to death. And so Peter wants to sound like he's not a Christian. So he begins to curse and to swear. Why? Because Christians don't curse and swear. And they, and they were like, huh, you're not cursing and swearing. Your speech betrays you. Oh, yeah? beep 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 <laughs> Peter was saying, I am not a Christian. I am not a Christ follower. He begins to re reject, and let me tell you a little warning here. Be ready when your friends reject you because you're a Christian. Because they will. They'll begin to make fun of you. They'll begin to prod you. They'll begin to do all sorts of things. And you will either begin to curse and swear, or you will say, I'm a follower of Christ. That's the reactions that we have here. And you'll see what happens in verse number 74. He began to curse, to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. The chance that Peter had to stand for his Lord was over. The chance that Peter had to defend Christ was over. And he remembered what Christ said. This is what I love about Peter. He weeps. He weeps bitterly. There's times in life where Christians ought to find themselves weeping bitterly because of the failures that we've had towards God. And I'll tell you something. If you haven't done it in a while, do it today. See how much you've hurt God. And when you see that, you can't help but cry and weep because of what you've done to Christ. Continue on in chapter 27, it says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So now the dawn has appeared. Pontius Pilate's in us getting up into, you know, in his morning. The courts are now opening, and they bring Jesus bound again. And here they are presenting him, and they want him put to death. Then Judas, which had betrayed him. Interesting how it pauses these scenes, right? In the middle of Caiaphas' house, the scene is paused, and it jumps over to who? Peter. But then you get to the Pilate's house, and it pauses, and it jumps to who? Judas. Both of these men betrayed Christ. Both of these men forsook Christ. Peter did, and Judas. Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And Peter, uh, Judas linked up with the wrong crowd, that's for sure. And he tries to take the money back, and he's trying to, he's trying to find some sort of relief from his sin. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. There's, man, there's man's attempt to deal with his own failures. And I'll tell you, you don't find Christ. 
it will drive you to the grave unquestionably. Unless you find Christ. Peter went out and hung himself. He went out and did it in a gross way. The Bible says in Acts that he fell headlong. He was disemboweled. That's what the Bible says. All to escape the innermost dread that he had, that he had betrayed the innocent one. We're going to see what Christ did, and had he turned to Christ and asked forgiveness, he would have found it. The son of perdition would have had it, but he didn't. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And I've got the picture here of Jesus standing in front of Pilate. Again, this is an artist rendering, but nonetheless, he went from a field of many people spitting at him, punching him, slapping him, into the audience of one, Pilate who was questioning him. And it says in, in uh, verse 11, it says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. In other words, you said it. I think it's okay if somebody wants to say that he meant you said it but not in the way that you meant it. Because he was more than just king of the Jews. Verse number 12, it says, And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. So it seems as though Jesus and, Pi and Pontius Pilate had an audience for just a little while alone. And Jesus stood before that Roman governor, and Roman governor asked him a question, and Jesus responded. And then at some point, the chief priests and the elders accused him. So at some point, they came into the scene. At some point, they, they were invited into this questioning. And Pilate marvels, and he marvels greatly because Jesus didn't respond to any of these accusations from the people that he had just spent all evening with, punching him, mocking him, spitting at him, slapping him. And verse 15 says, Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And when they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas, therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? So every year at the Passover feast, it was customary that one prisoner was released. Just like today's culture, we have the president is allowed to pardon. They're called presidential pardons. And generally, most of the pardons happen at the end of the presidency. Although ever so often you'll see them happen throughout. But at the end of the presidency, when President Trump was uh, about ready to move himself out of office, what did he do? He pardoned a certain number of individuals. So did President Obama. So did President Wright go down the list. So it was customary in the Jewish culture that every year they would release one prisoner. And so Pilate gets a trick. And he says, you know, I don't see fault in this man, Jesus, so I'm going to go get the worst criminal that I can find, and it happened to be Barabbas. Now, Bar means son of, right? Barabbas. What does Abba mean? Father. Interesting enough that he brings out a son of the father with the son of the father on either side of him. The son of God and the son of man. On either side of him. God's word is spectacular, filled with fireworks if you study it. And you're amazed every time you turn the page. And he says, surely the Jews will release Jesus now because Barabbas was hated. The worst of man was hated. And what was the conclusion? It says here in uh, verse number, lost my place here, verse number... 
17, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. You think about that. Pilate's own wife came in and said, Don't have nothing to do with that man, Jesus. He's a just man. And Pilate didn't listen to his wife. Instead, he was pressured by the throngs of the chief priest and the Jews and the elders. And they said, we want Barabbas released to us. And then he asked them a question. He says, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And they all say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. Can you hear the, the, ch the, 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 the chants growing louder and Pilate growing more frustrated? Hey, Pilate was doing everything he can. Pilate was a wicked man. He was a cruel man. But even this cruel man was understanding that, th that Jesus was delivered because of envy. And he was trying to say, why? Why? And they would cry louder, crucify him. The throngs of people there at the bema seat of Pilate. And when verse 24 says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He washed his hands in water in a symbolic way of saying, I have nothing to do with this. Take Jesus and crucify him. In truth, he had everything to do with it, because without Pilate's approval, they couldn't have crucified him. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered in unto him the whole band of soldiers. And here's what they did to a man who has already been spit upon, to a man who has already been punched, to a man who has been slapped, to a man who was bound. The Bible says, and when they had, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now picture the scene here. A bound prisoner who was probably already bruised. And they strip him and they put a, a scarlet robe on him. They give him a stick or a scepter. They put a crown, a mock crown made out of thorns. And they jab that into his into his brow, and they, and they bow the knee, and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. And picture all these soldiers, all these soldiers surrounding this, this spectacle. And if that wasn't enough, verse 30 says, And they spit upon him and took the reed, you know, the one that they just gave him, that rod. They took it out of his hand. And smote him on the head. Now you think about that. It wasn't that long ago when I was a child and I had Butch come over to my house to play. One of my best friends, and we had baseball. And we were sitting there and we were playing. And I remember my brother Andy, man, he swung this bat. Whoosh. And it swirled around and boom! It hit Butch right in that head. Boom! Blood everywhere. I can remember that to this day. It's one of the highlights of horror in my young childhood. I remember seeing this. Like, oh, hey, I thought the guy was going to die. They took, this, they took this, this reed and they smote Christ on the head after spitting on him. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled to bear his cross. I skipped a small little section here because in verse number 
In verse number 26, it says, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That scourging is a whipping. The scourging was, it's, they, they were famous for their, for their cat of nine tails, okay? They would tie these people to a post similar to this and in this manner, and they would whip a person. And when I say whip, the Roman rule was 39 lashings. It doesn't say how many times they whipped, but, but history would detail 39 times because 40 was death. And so they would take you to the brink of death. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, he who had authority, he was a governor as well in the Galilean region, he bragged about how he whipped one man one time until his entrails fell out. And that was customary in these times of whipping. And so this little verse that says that they scourged Jesus, they did all of this before they crowned him with a crown of thorns. They scourged him like this. And the cat of nine tails or this, flag, this, uh, this whip here would have had a wooden handle. It would have had leather wrapped around it. It would have, been, it would have had uh, lead balls or metal balls, most likely lead. On the ends of it would have had bone pieces into it, and they would have used this weapon. This was the 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 flagrum. The, this was the Roman whip, known as the cat of nine tails. And and uh, if, if it was a cat of nine tails, it would have had nine strands versus the two or three. But it was this that they would have whipped Jesus with, and after whipping Christ, to to the point where his entrails fell out. And the Bible, we know that if, if Josephus whipped a man where his innards were falling out, the Bible says in Isaiah that Jesus Christ was marred more than any other man in human history. Then we know that he must have suffered greater than the man that Josephus was bragging about. And after they whipped him, then they put scarlet robes on him. Then they spit on him. Then they take the reed and hit him on his head. Then they circle him and bow the knee and cry out, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they lead him to the place of Golgotha. And the Bible says that they came and they found a man, Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to bear his cross. No wonder why they compelled somebody to bear his cross. Nobody was going to step in and help him. And so they compel a man. He couldn't bear the cross. He was marred. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a school, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. The prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and the elders, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come now down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice man's actions to God's. The agony that Christ pours out was not about man's wrongs to him. But he was crying out, saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there 
when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come and save him. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What Christ suffered on the cross ought never be forgotten because he died for you and he died for me. And just before all of that took place, he gave his disciples a piece of bread and he says, take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. And he gave them a cup, and he says, drink. This is the blood of, my, of the new covenant. Jesus is saying, don't forget what I went through for you. Don't forget what I suffered for you. Don't forget the agony that I bore in your stead, in your place, for your sins. Show it till I come. Remember me till I come. That's all he wants us to do is remember him till he comes. Let's pray and then we'll take the Lord's Supper and we'll be dismissed. Ray, would you pray for us, please?